Good morning. Welcome to the 2021 Kutztown University faculty and staff convocation and celebration. Last academic year was unlike any other in our history as we carried out our mission in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. We will start this morning's program with our traditional year in review photo show featuring the work of university photographer Andy Russell. Please direct your attention to the screen. Please welcome Kutztown University President, Dr. Kenneth S. Hawkinson. Thank you, Matt. Welcome to the 2021 faculty and staff convocation and celebration. It is with great, great joy that I speak to you, the faculty, staff, and administrators today. I am truly thankful that we're able to celebrate together and in person at this convocation. I'd like to acknowledge our Council of Trustees members for all they do for our university. My thanks to Tom Heck, past chair, Robert Grimm, vice chair, and Evan Santos, student trustee, for being here today. Would the three of you please rise and be recognized. We also have the president of our student government here today, Kayla Sherry. Kayla, will you please rise? <laughs> Let me also acknowledge my office staff, Toya Haywood, Pam Rex, and Amy Reidenauer. <laughs> and let me 
acknowledge my wife, Anne-Marie Hayes Hawkinson, who works quietly behind the scenes to promote KU with many audiences. She is tireless in her support of this university and her support of me. Anne-Marie, please stand up. <laughs> I believe that the purpose of this gathering is to celebrate the accomplishments of our faculty and staff and to update you on the significant happenings of the university and on our progress in moving the university forward. But let me begin by saying a few words about the struggles we have been through in the last year and a half. It's been 18 months since my message went out to our university community announcing the many changes we had undertaken to move nearly all our functions online or through some form of virtual communication in the spring of 2020. I had often said leading up to 2020 that it would be the year of perfect vision. It turned out to be a year of unknowns, continual adjustments to our protocols, and trying to find our way through the deep fog of a worldwide pandemic. I witnessed the act of numerous individuals, faculty, staff, students, others in our community who performed their duties with professionalism and competence. Our wonderful faculty transitioned 1,767 face-to-face -face classes to some form of online technology in the spring of 2020. This was truly an amazing accomplishment. This past academic year, we returned to campus by offering a combination of classes on campus and through hybrid and online modalities. Our students made many sacrifices in their on-campus experience, all for the common good of the health and wellness of our campus community under the new normal. Our faculty have displayed a calm fortitude in working to continue to maintain standards while allowing flexibility and compassion for those students who may have been struggling. It was the contribution of so many people from all the units on campus and the support of all of you here today that led to our successful reopening in the fall, our ability to offer a modified in-person experience for learning and living throughout this past year. I was in continual contact with the leaders of the university to include faculty leaders, student leaders, supervisors, health experts, state system officials, and many others. Many of these leaders served on the Emergency Management Committee and I want to thank all members of this committee for their tireless efforts in putting our reopening plans together. And the many others who have contributed their time and ideas to this endeavor. I was delighted last year when our Council of Trustees recognized our health center professionals with a resolution thanking them for their selfless actions to serve the health needs of our community during this terrible pandemic. Will you please join me in expressing the university's appreciation to our health center personnel. <laughs> Thank you. As we open next week, Cookstown University strongly encourages members of its campus community to get vaccinated. While we do not have the authority to require the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine is an important tool to help us end the pandemic. We join the CDC in strongly recommending that all members of our university community choose to be vaccinated, unless there are religious or health reasons that would prevent them from doing so. Kutztown University's mask protocols reflect CDC guidance based on recommendations from Pennsylvania's Departments of Health and Education. We will follow the science and the guidance of the CDC and other health officials. Latest guidance is that while Berks County remains at a high COVID level, masks will be required indoors. As with all information regarding the pandemic, the guidance is fluid and we will change as the guidance changes. Please note that the governor's emergency order derived from the CDC and other entities ended on June 1st. This removed the mandate for social distancing in the classroom and other locations, removed the mask requirement at that time, and suspended various special COVID-related leave opportunities for our employees. We are committed to keeping our promise to our students and will not convert any in-person classes to online modalities. Should the governor reinstate his emergency order, we will certainly comply with all the guidelines. 
we continue to have in place many safety measures to help prevent the spread of all infectious diseases. Please see our full safety plan on our pandemic website. Let me also inject a few words about the unrest in our country this past year after the killing of George Floyd. We are well aware of the challenges we have faced collectively as a campus, commonwealth, nation, and world in the past year. It is important that we take care of ourselves and that we take care of each other. We must continue to come together as a university community to talk, to listen, to comfort without judgment, to have difficult conversations, and to help each other so as to make us stronger as a people and as a nation. We have done much to address systematic injustices. Last summer, we asked our community for help in addressing these injustices, and over 100 initiatives were developed, each with action items attached. Our Commission on the Status of Minorities, under the leadership of Dr. Arthur Garrison, has been working all year on a Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, or JEDI, strategic plan that has since been embedded into our university strategic plan. I also understand that while we, have many, while we have made these efforts to fight against social injustice, there is still a lot of work to do. Words are not enough. We need to proactively seek out the concerns of our students, faculty, and staff, and continue to develop actions to make Kutztown University even better. Our Vice President of Enrollment Management and Student Affairs, Dr. Warren Hilton, will speak more on this in a few minutes. As many of you are aware, Kutztown University, the state system, and higher education institutions across the country are at a crossroads. Here in Pennsylvania especially, enrollments are down, public investment has continued to lag behind the needs of our state universities, and as a result, student debt has risen as our students are forced to carry more of the financial burden. This is not unique to Pennsylvania. These are trends sweeping the nation. It is not a sustainable situation, and that is why there has been a massive system redesign effort to fundamentally change the operating model of all the system universities, including Kutztown. Through the comprehensive planning process, greater accountability has been placed on universities to ensure that their income matches their expenses. Now, we have, while we have done better than most in our enrollment this year, we have been in a downward trend for 10 years, and it is required of us to align our expenditures and workforce to the current complement of students. We have done well. We have balanced our budget for four years and have adjusted our workforce through attrition and greater efficiency we have not resorted to retrenchments or furloughs. All this has been done during a tuition freeze for three years, which we support, inadequate state funding, and rising costs. We have made great progress in meeting the financial expectations of the state system and will continue to do so in the coming year. Vice President Matt Delaney will go into greater detail on this in just a few minutes. The state system is also in the process of centralizing certain services and in integrating six of our sister schools into two new universities. While we are sharing in certain services, we are not under any consideration for integration with any other school. Looking to the agenda for this morning, as I did, last, as I did in last year's convocation, I will ask each of my cabinet officers and my director of institutional research to update you on the accomplishments and updates of their areas. They will then share some examples of strategic initiatives they have for the coming year. In addition, we will honor those who have been selected to receive university awards, such as Employee of the Month and Year, and the recognition of other honorees and award recipients. We will also recognize those faculty tenured or promoted effective this fall. Finally, I will provide closing comments at the end. Now, before we move on to these presentations, it is my pleasure to welcome all the new faculty and staff who have joined us over the past year and who are with us today. Anne-Marie and I look forward to meeting you all in person at the various receptions we will have at our house this year. With those new employees who are with us today, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. To our new employees, 
When I began my presidency at Kutztown University in July of 2015, I spoke of a place. I used the formula, values plus space equals place. To simply occupy space leads to a very unfulfilling life. But when one adds values to that space, it converts to a place, a community where one lives and learns and transcends to a level greater than one can reach as an individual. Kutztown University is such a place where students can come to a safe and enriching environment in a beautiful part of the world and learn and grow and mature into an enlightened and productive citizens. This is a wonderful place to live and work and we thank you for joining our community. So to get started with our presentations, it is now my pleasure to introduce our Director of Institutional Research, Natalie Cartwright. Among her many duties, she was instrumental in working with the Strategic Planning Committee in developing our new Kutztown University Strategic Plan. She will brief you all on the process we went through in developing this plan, how it is structured, and the reporting process used to measure success. Natalie? Good morning. Thank you, President Hawkinson, for the introduction. Today, it is my great pleasure to share with you all the Kutztown University 2021-2024 Strategic Plan. First, I'll offer a short background on the strategic planning process. When the Chancellor arrived in 2018, he initiated significant changes regarding system redesign phase one. Included in this was what became known as goal alignment, a university goal planning process enabling universities to create multi-year student and university success goals. Universities were required by December 2019 to submit a goal planning document, integrating current and new strategies in the course of their own planning processes. The Office of the Chancellor staff would then incorporate these planning documents and create a goal planning workbook. We now know this workbook as the comprehensive planning process, which universities are required to submit each September. In early 2019, knowing that there would be changes to planning processes due to system redesign, we chose to extend our 2016-2019 strategic plan to 2020. The goal alignment document, as you may remember, outlined four main goals, new student enrollment, retention, fundraising, and financial sustainability. With this new process in place and goals identified, the Strategic Planning and Resource Committee of the University Senate, known as SPRC, initiated conversation to revise the now 2016-2020 plan in spring of 2020. Best laid plans. We all know what happened, the world paused, everyone pivoted, and as President Hawkinson has said, we entered into a year of unknowns and continual adjustment. Between the end of fall 2020 and the start of spring 21 semester, with our feet virtually underneath us, the SPRC reignited discussion on a revision to the strategic plan and outlined a process for moving forward. By March, the subcommittee was charged with bringing a draft plan back to the committee as a whole. The subcommittee submitted its first draft on April 9th and its second draft on April 21st. At the April 23rd meeting of the full SPRC, the committee voted to endorse the draft plan. The endorsed plan was then made available for review and comment to trustees faculty, staff, and students. In addition, the University Senate hosted an open forum on the strategic plan during their April 29th meeting. The feedback was gathered, presented to, his, to the President and his Cabinet, and in July, the final strategic plan, 2021-2024, was approved. Strategic plan 21-24 has five goals. The most notable change from the previous plan is the addition of goal two, student success. Goal two was added to give a home to retention, persistence, and career readiness 
as well as add an objective for well-being, which allows goal one, academic excellence, to focus on excellence in teaching and assessment of learning. In addition, we have incorporated other foundational plans into the overall strategic plan. For example, goal five objectives related to our financial planning are aligned with state system sustainability process and indicators. Goal two objectives related to new student enrollment and retention are derived from our ongoing strategic enrollment management plan. Goal four objectives related to a caring campus incorporate the planning of our commission on the status of minorities on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Fundraising objectives and results are derived from our foundation strategic plan and the foundation's comprehensive campaign. I would now like to take this opportunity to provide an overview of the objectives and key results included in the 21-24 plan. Goal one, academic excellence. Objective one, promote exceptional teaching with a focus on enhancing teaching, pedagogy, pedagogy and instructional practices. Objective two, commit to continuous improvement of academic programs by using results of regular and rigorous assessment. This focuses on the first year seminar, aligning student learning outcomes with institutional learning outcomes for graduate programs, Assessments focused on curriculum and pedagogy and closing the loop on general education. Objective three, ensure students engage in high impact practices and experiential learning. This objective targets students in specific populations such as honors, stars, and profs, as well as ensuring at least one experiential learning experience for all students by senior year. Objective four, Enhance and encourage research, creativity, and innovation. This includes increasing grant proposals by faculty, a mechanism for faculty to share research across campus, as well as mentoring opportunities. Goal two, student success. Objective one, improve academic success of all students. The results for this objective are measures of retention, persistence, and graduation. Any actions taken to improve student success should be targeted toward retaining and graduating our current students. Objective two, ensure graduates are prepared for a successful career. The main focus here is ensuring that student learning outcomes and curriculum are aligned with field-related career readiness, that students are academically prepared to enter the workforce. Objectives three and four are focused on student engagement. When students are engaged or feel like they belong, retention increases. These objectives are directed towards increasing student participation in activities and co-curricular programming that promote engagement, such as the honors program, on-campus employment, athletics, rec sports, as well as performance and the arts. Also, KU is intentionally increasing our focus on student well-being through continued wellness programming. Goal three, community and civic engagement. Objective one, develop new and strengthen existing programs that address the workforce needs. This objective strives to answer the question, is KU offering academic programs that reflect the workforce needs of the region, as well as offering opportunities for those already in the workforce to reskill or upskill, in addition to serving the small business of the region through the SBDC. Objective two, strengthen, enhance, and expand partnerships. This specifically targets the Pashi Grant Program, Prepared for PA, the Upward Bound Program, the Gear Up Program, and expanding the reach of the Profs Program. Objective three, expand community and alumni engagement with the university. This objective focuses on engaging the students with the community and harnessing the power of our 70,000 living alumni. Goal four, caring campus community. Goal four is closely tied to Pashi system DEI efforts as well as KU's JEDI strategic planning. Objective one, create a campus culture that is committed to a diverse, equitable, inclusive, 
and accessible environment and that champions the success of all members of its community. This objective will increase DEI efforts in curricular and co-curricular settings, create support structure, ensure that the language on public documents is gender inclusive, and in create DEI training experiences for all first year students. Objective two, expand DEI professional development programming for all. This centers around DEI training for faculty and staff as well as workshops regarding culturally responsive pedagogy. Objective three, improve the diversity of the KU campus community. This objective strives to have a student population reflect the diversity of the region, as well as, as an assessment of diversity in all shared governance committees and university leadership. This objective also calls for increased support for different learning and ability modalities. Objective four, create accountability and transparency for DEI efforts. This is tied to the KU Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Strategic Plan currently in development by the Commission on the Status of Minorities and calls for an annual assessment and reporting. Objective five, improve the effectiveness, accountability, and transparency of the shared governance system. This calls for a comprehensive review of the efficacy of the shared governance system to be completed, as well as exploring innovative channels for communication among all campus stakeholders. Goal five, sustainability of resources and stewardship of place. Objective one, increase overall university enrollment. Key results for this objective are tied directly to the Strategic Enrollment Management Plan, which Dr. Hilton will speak in more detail about shortly. Objective two, maintain a balanced budget without the use of cash reserves. This ensures that our annual expenses are aligned with our annual revenues. Objective three, attain financial sustainability as defined by Pashi system redesign. This objective is tied directly to the system comprehensive planning process for financial sustainability, improving our annualized FTE, our annual operating margin, our primary reserve ratio, and monitoring our minimum reserves. Objective four, the Kutztown University Foundation will conduct a comprehensive campaign. This objective calls for the foundation to raise six million plus dollars annually. Objective five, enhance university campus through capital projects and environmental sustainability initiatives. This objective outlines multiple building renovations throughout the cycle of the plan, as well as embarking on a comprehensive environmental sustainability plan. Objective six is the final objective outlined in the 2021-2024 plan, and it is certainly last but not least. This objective is to ensure that a Kutztown University education remains affordable by increasing our investment in institutionally funded scholarships. Fortunately, this document is not where the story ends. Strategic planning should be an iterative process where we build, refine, and improve, or create, test, and revise until we're satisfied with the end result. That is where annual divisional operational plans become important. By September, divisions will identify what actions they will tie to key results for 21-22. For each action, divisions will identify a time frame and a point of contact. Also, they will provide cost estimates for the actions. Some will require additional funding, which would be brought to cabinet, and some may require no funding, but other additional resources. It is not expected that a division have an action for every result in a given year, but the plan will serve as a roadmap for attaining all results or revising results by 2024. Cabinet will collectively review progress on these actions twice a year, once as an interim report in December and once as an annual report in July, including any recommendation for plan revisions. This process then creates a three-year rolling strategic plan. For example, this is part of the operational plan for finance and facilities. 
This action that they will take against the key result of annual operating expenses are aligned with annual recurring revenues within the ENG and auxiliary operations for the 21-22 year. You can see the specific actions spelled out, the collaborations across divisions, and the proposed resources. Moving forward, Cabinet will receive operational plans in July, along with annual reports for the prior year, which they will discuss during their retreat for recommendation, revision, and resource allocation. On behalf of President Hawkinson and his Cabinet, I would like to thank, to extend our sincerest gratitude to Strategic Planning and Resource Committee Chair, Dr. Ed Simpson, and the subcommittee members, Dr. Ann Carroll, Dr. Karen Rout, Dr. Daryl Johnson, Professor Holly Tinkin, and Dr. Katherine McGeehan for leading the entire SPRC to bring the 2021-2024 strategic plan to fruition. Over this next strategic planning cycle, Kutztown University faces unprecedented challenges that will need to be met with all the capital of the university, both human and monetary, in order to foster our mission as a vibrant, affordable, comprehensive, multifaceted educational institution. One of the most powerful things that leaders can do is be open to possibility. But being open to possibility can require a paradigm shift. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. When leadership is defined as a way of being, we find that we can lead from any chair. John Quincy Adams said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. With a commitment to remaining agile, flexible, and transparent, Kutztown University will confront its challenges, expand on its strengths, and lead with possibility. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce our new provost and vice president of academic affairs, Dr. Lauren Baston Arnold. She comes to KU with many years of experience and success as an administrator and as a member of the faculty. We are very fortunate to have her join our administration. Lauren. Thank you. Thank you for letting me join you as provost. I'm so pleased to be here with you as we embark on this 21-22 academic year. Since I arrived on campus in late June, I've been learning about the campus and the larger system, meeting with campus constituencies and setting up times to meet with more faculty and staff in the coming weeks, looking at our processes and structures in academic affairs for areas where we might create greater efficiencies that will allow faculty, staff, and administrators the space and time to fulfill their goals and permit us to better serve our students, faculty, staff, and the larger local and regional communities. I've been getting acquainted with the campus community and the local community, and I've been talking about the many successes of KU. You had an extremely successful year in 2021, even with the stress and the quick changes of the pandemic. Time doesn't really permit me to even skim the surface, so I'll mention one or two items related to each area of the strategic plan. In University Goal 1, Academic Excellence, through the hard work of faculty and staff across the university, you supported almost 183,000 credit hours of undergraduate and graduate education. And you did that with dedication, flexibility, and grace. You also completed the final Middle States Commission on Higher, Accredit Higher Education, goodness. What is it that we do again? Small team review successfully this year. In University Goal 2, student success, you achieved grants connected to student learning and success, including NSF's STEM grants for almost a million dollars, designed to recruit and support talented mathematics, computer science, and information technology students. 
650 career coaching appointments were provided to students, along with tutoring for more than 500 students and support for 48 courses through supplemental instruction. For community and civic engagement, you supported the larger community with programs like Music Monday, communication design portfolio prep workshops, design day camps, the KU Summer Music Festival for high school artists, the PA and KU Small Business Development Centers, as well as an ESL conference that was held in May of 2021. In support of our Caring Campus community, you created a faculty discussion group about trauma-informed pedagogy. You held virtual celebrations, and you conducted important DEI work and training. In sustainability of resources and stewardship of place, you work together to engage campus donors, develop and participate in academic and administrative assessment, and carefully planned our course offerings with attention to the demands of both quality pedagogy and sustainable budgeting. So what's next? The deans and the unit leaders will be working with chairs, faculty, and staff to work on goals for 21-22 that are specific, manageable, attainable, relevant, and timely. In that vein, I would like to briefly mention some general near-term priority items that are linked to the strategic plan for academic affairs. As you've heard, we'll be engaging in some restructuring to facilitate our ability to grow strength in targeted areas. This will allow us to focus on enhancing our offerings in graduate programs, workforce development, and lifelong learning, as well as our affiliations with area businesses, nonprofits, and educational institutions. We'll work to support uh, increased, we'll work to increase faculty support in their pursuit of ongoing excellence with further development of the Center for the Enhancement of Teaching, professional development opportunities for faculty, and expanded DEI efforts in hiring, academic affairs processes, and faculty support. We'll continue to develop and enhance student opportunities to engage in high impact practices across the academic career by enhancing first year uh, experiences and also in supporting the honors program. And we'll engage in a clear iterative relationship between assessment and planning through supporting the work of staff engaged in assessment leadership, providing professional development opportunities related to assessment, and facilitating the feedback loop between assessment and planning. All this work will take the combined efforts of many across the campus and will help us to continue our excellence in education, scholarship, and creative activity, as well as our service to the region. In the spirit of celebrating that excellence, I would like to acknowledge the following members of our community whose names will appear on the screen behind me. Will the faculty who achieved promotion to associate professor in 2021 please stand? Will the faculty who achieved promotion to full professor this year please stand? And will the faculty who achieved tenure in 2021 please stand? Congratulations to all faculty who were promoted or tenured in 2020-2021. I would also like to acknowledge three faculty members who are being honored with special awards for their work. The John P. Schellenberg Award for Teaching and Learning was established by Dr. Schellenberg, Professor Emeritus of the Physical Sciences Department, as well as faculty, alumni, and friends to recognize an early career faculty member who's demonstrated outstanding work within the mission of the Center for the Enhancement of Teaching. To be eligible for the Schellenberg Award, an individual must have been on the faculty full-time at least three, but not more than seven years. The recipient is chosen based on the following three areas pedagogy and curriculum innovation, learning technology innovation, assessment and or research on learning.
The recipient of this year's John P. Schellenberg Award for Teaching and Learning is Dr. Corey Newlander, Department of Anthropology and Sociology. The Chambliss Fam Faculty Award was inaugurated in 2004 through a gift from Dr. Carlson R. Chambliss, Professor Emeritus of the Physical Sciences Department. Dr. Chambliss has been extremely generous in creating honors to recognize the success of the KU family, including the best and brightest of our students. The Chambliss Faculty Award is meant to recognize the very highest achievement in research and scholarship and can be awarded only once in a person's career. Our first winner is Dr. Laura Sherrod, Department of Physical Sciences. Our second winner is Dr. Valerie Trollinger, Department of Music. Unfortunately, Dr. Trollinger is unable to join us today and I accept the award on her behalf. Applause of course, we have not only amazing faculty, but also impressive students. To speak more about those members of our community, I would like to introduce our Vice President of Enrollment Management and Student Affairs, Dr. Warren Hilton. Thank you, Provost Bayesden Arnold. Good morning. On behalf of the Enrollment Management and Student Affairs Division, welcome to the 2021-2022 academic year. My plan this morning is to give you an update on undergraduate new student enrollment, our strategic enrollment management planning process, and share some action items we can expect to work on in the coming year related to the university strategic plan. But first, I would like to thank all of the staff and faculty in the Enrollment Management and Student Affairs Division. You have worked tirelessly during the pandemic to provide our students with a residential experience and to serve students regardless of their situation last year. Your focus on student well-being was appreciated. I heard from many students that they appreciated your hard work. Thank you, and I appreciate and love working with you. I'd like to first review our freshman cohort numbers in comparison to fall 2020. This data reported reflects the moment in which this presentation was prepared, and obviously we have a little bit of a more clear picture now, which I will discuss in a second. As was the case last year, we saw a decrease in applications and an increase in admitted students. The SAT, ACT optional admissions policy has been a major factor for comprehensive universities like KU seeing less applications and more admits. As of the beginning of August, we saw a decrease in deposits over last year. However, last year we had an extremely high number, roughly 160 deposited students walk away between the beginning of August and our freeze date. At present, we remain hopeful that the majority of our deposited students will show up to give us a second straight year of increase freshman enrollment. This is no small feat, given the challenges that the pandemic posed with recruitment. Again, I want to thank the staff and faculty in our division, as well as everyone at the university involved in recruitment efforts. Next, with regards to new transfer students, the steep declines in enrollment at community colleges, some as large as 10%, have affected us. 
less students at community colleges meant that we had less transfers to recruit this year. Also, community colleges remaining virtual all year cut off our ability to recruit transfer students in person. With all of these challenges, we have not seen a sharp decline in transfer students. Since the beginning of August, we have continued to see movement regarding our transfer deposit numbers, and we will continue to work with this population right up to the start of classes next week. Given the steady decline in high school grads in our region and the enrollment challenges of community colleges, KU remains a destination for students local to KU, as you will see on the next slide. We believe that our success is due in part to our scholarship model that was first adopted for the class that entered in fall 2020. While it was tough work, KU's new student enrollment held steady in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is good news to build on as we have already started recruiting for next year. As alluded to on the last slide, KU enrolled for fall of 2020 almost 50% of admitted students from Berks and Lehigh County and almost 40% of admitted students from Schuylkill County. This is a very good sign for any comprehensive university to have good market share in your own backyard. As discussed in the fall, at the fall 2019 opening celebration, we embarked on a year-long strategic enrollment management planning process in an effort to determine the goals and actions to lead KU to sustainable enrollment over the next few years. The planning process involved over 50 faculty, staff, and students. However, we were interrupted by the pandemic but we have arrived at a completed plan that will be shared with the campus community later this fall. The goals of the plan align with the university strategic plan and will be tracked as part of the university's strategic plan biannual reporting process that you've heard about earlier. This coming year in the enrollment management and student division, enrollment management and student affairs division, will be marked by increased collaboration with other divisions at the university. Our efforts related to accomplishing the goals and objectives of the university strategic plan point us to a collective effort. We plan to work with the university relations and athletics division to embark on new marketing efforts to attract more students to KU. We have already reorganized the admissions office to include a transfer admission center in Old Main, designed to be a collaborative space between undergraduate admissions, the registrar's office, and the financial aid office to serve our incoming transfer students. This effort will require the support of software such as Transferology and TES to help us respond to prospective transfer student needs. We plan to work with academic affairs to find a pathway to build on the foundation of the Transfer Admissions Center to create a transfer success center that will not only help incoming students but support current KU transfer students in reaching graduation. The pandemic further emphasized our need to focus on student well-being. Out of a necessity, we led efforts with students, faculty, and staff to have five wellness days in the spring 2021 semester. The success of the Wellness Days was documented by Christine Storch in my office, Dr. Brenner from the Counseling, Education, and Student Affairs Department, and Director of Institutional Research, Natalie Cartwright. The days were so well received by the KU community, especially our students, that we plan to continue well-being efforts in new and creative ways this coming year. We plan to work with Academic Affairs to explore implementing an early alert system. We also plan, as Dr. Hawkinson alluded to, regarding DEI issues to double down on those DEI efforts to help diverse populations persist and graduate. For example, to capitalize on the success of the AIMS program, Achievement Initiative for Male Success, which was designed to improve persistence and completion of black and Hispanic males, I am pleased that Melinda Quiones and other campus partners are working towards building a program similar to AIMS 
for our female students. And lastly, we will work with the KU Foundation to secure additional funding for our Providing Resources and Opportunities for Future Standouts program, or as we affectionately call it, PROFS. The PROFS program provides assistance to KU students who have experience with foster care. This program's primary funding source is Child Promise under the leadership of former Kutztown University Frederick Douglass Institute scholar and honorary doctorate recipient, Dr. Nathaniel Williams, and Charles Kwan, who is a well-known advocate for marginalized populations. Working with Child Promise, the Kutztown University Foundation, and other generous donors such as the Why I'm Missing Foundation, we have plans to further expand the program to 50 students by including homeless as well as food and housing insecure students. Since the program's inception in 2017, several KU faculty and staff have indicated that we should do more to educate the KU community about the PROFS program. Therefore, I invite your attention to the screen to watch a three and a half minute video about the program. Exceeding expectations, many kids who go through the foster care system often think they can't go to college for lack of funds or housing, but a local university is making it possible through their program that helps kids who are in the system. They're highlighting it during National Foster Care Month. I had a series of super terrible foster parents that um, really pretended like that they cared and they just really didn't. The road to adulthood has not been a smooth one for Sydney Alfiero. I've been in the foster care system since I was 13 years old and I aged out uh, at 18. Um, I went through five different foster homes by the time that I graduated high school and uh, six different high schools, 13 schools in total, elementary, middle and high school, um, two shelters, uh, one residential and two hospitalizations. But the history major is thriving in the face of adversity. Foster care is honestly really better than like what you have at home, but it's still not an ideal place to be. And the only way that you're really able to get out of it and able to make progress for yourself in the world is to get educated. Getting an education is exactly what she's doing. In the fall, Alfiero will head into her senior year at Kutztown University, and she hopes to pursue a master's in organized psychology when she graduates, something made possible by the school's PROFS program, which stands for providing resources and opportunities for future standouts. The program fills in the gaps for students who have experience for foster care in order to help them graduate from college. The Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs, Warren Hilton, says with support from a group called Child Promise, PROFS helps with emergency funding, housing over breaks, and stipends to help with living expenses, lifting the stressful costs associated with a college degree. In our generation, we're called like, I don't know, boomerang children, I think it is, where pretty much everybody tends to go back to their family after college because they can't afford to live on their own. And we don't really have that luxury, so we're all the more disadvantaged when it comes to just simply having a place to stay while we're attempting to get our education and better ourselves. Roughly each year, about 7 to 13 percent of foster care youth indicate they want to go to college. Many of them do not, and the ones that do go to college end up mostly not completing college. So our program is designed to help students who have experience with foster care walk across the stage. I was going through family issues, um, trying to help with paying the rent, um, trying to find food and things like that for my family. So when I was talking to a social worker at the high school, um, while she was helping me with all my issues, she was like, all right, you're a senior, like, what are you going to do now? Um, and I always knew I wanted to go to college, but I didn't know how. Um, so she kind of helped me like fill out applications, kind of gave me more information, and then I ended up here. Keisha Lee Sanchez has also experienced homelessness and spent time in foster care. I didn't think it was possible for me to college. Um, I was always told that I just had to work to help my family. I actually didn't even know that I could pay for college after. I thought you had to pay ahead, so I didn't. I didn't have the money, so I didn't think that was going to be possible at all. Now the Reading High School grad is going into her junior year at KU and getting ready to embark on a second study abroad trip. I got to study abroad to Cuba 
uh, my freshman year um, for 12 days studying the difference uh, between the U.S. education and the Cuban education. And then this summer I'll be studying abroad to Spain for an entire month to do some uh, Spanish classes. The students are given both big and small opportunities, including those many of us take for granted. I'm happy to report that both students in the vid video graduated from KU in May of 2021, and they joined six other prof students who have completed their degree at KU. This is especially noteworthy, noteworthy given that less than 13% of foster care youth attend college and the overwhelming majority that do matriculate our, at our institutions of higher education never graduate. As we journey through the 2021-2022 academic year, I want to again thank you for your past collaboration and the collective work to come as we make Kutztown University the best institution it can be. Looking forward to a great and golden year. Thank you. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce our Vice President of Social Equity and Compliance, Mr. Jesus Pena. Thank you, Dr. Hilton. Good morning and welcome to the 2021-22 academic year. The Division of Equity and Compliance consists of the Office of Social Equity, the Disability Services Office, the Department of Public Safety and Police Services, and the Department of Human Resources, which is now located in what was formerly the Admissions Center. In the coming year, our division will pursue a number of action items in furtherance of our strategic plan. I will begin my remarks by focusing on goal four, caring campus community. In the Office of Social Equity, we will continue to work with all constituents on campus by promptly responding to incidents and by offering training to ensure we are providing a campus free of discrimination and harassment of any kind in compliance with our laws and university policies. Our Office of Disability Services is pleased to welcome back our close to 700 students registered with our office. Our steadfast commitment to our students with disabilities enables us to support our students by providing a level playing field so they may excel and benefit from all KU has to offer. The DSO has gone through a reorganization over the past year. Many of the changes stem from recommendations from the last department's external review, which included suggestions from our faculty and students. Technology advances have created both opportunities and challenges for students with disabilities. As more and more specialized computer technology has been integrated into the campus living and learning environments at KU. Many of the challenges are connected to accessibility and equal access to technology and learning materials. Addressing these accessibility concerns requires specialized knowledge in assistive technology. Consequently, this past June, the DSO hired an Assistant Director of Assistive and Computer Technologies, Mr. Brian Daly, who will support our students and work with our faculty to help provide equal access to technology and course materials. Thank you to our faculty and staff for joining our efforts in supporting our students with disabilities, thereby creating a caring campus community, as well as contributing to student success, goal two of our strategic plan. Our public safety and police services department remains committed to its mission to serve and protect all of our campus constituents. In line with our university's DEI initiatives, our public safety officers will continue to receive training in the areas of diversity and the appropriate use of force. In addition, our officers will continue to go into our classrooms as presenters on topics of interest to our students, as well as continue with the Coffee with a Cop program to open lines of communication 
and build a bridge of understanding and trust. Related to goal five, sustainability of resources and stewardship of place. Our Public Safety and Police Services Department will update and modernize the university's security infrastructure. We will install additional cameras throughout our campus in areas identified in the Security System Master Plan to provide a greater level of security and safety. Also in connection with Goal 5, the Office of Social Equity will continue to compile the university's annual affirmative action plan to offer us a snapshot of our workforce to determine if there is underutilization of women and or minorities. If there is any underutilization, we will collaborate with others on campus to remedy those deficiencies. Our Human Resources Department will continue to support and serve our workforce so we may fulfill our university's mission. We value our employees and all you do for our students. And to acknowledge your exemplary work, since 2017, we have recognized the Employee of the Month and the Employee of the Year, all selected by the HR Advisory Committee. This initiative was established by President Hawkinson and Mrs. Anne Marie Hayes Hawkinson. Thank you both for your generosity in sponsoring this program, and thank you to the HR Advisory Committee for your valuable contributions. Employee of the Month honorees are all eligible for the Employee of the Year Award. At this time, I would like to recognize the winners of Employee of the Month for the last fiscal year, and I will then introduce the KU Employee of the Year. The Employees of the Month listed on the screen are as follows. July 2020, Louis Rashuti Storeroom. August 2020, Michael Demeter, Student Conduct. September 2020, Desiree Reisner. <laughs> Residence Life. October 2020, Christina Ferris, Biological Sciences. November 2020, Donna Younger, Facilities. December 2020, Dr. Peter Isaacson, Music. January 2021, Kate Peffley, Registrar's Office. February 2021, Nancy Snyder, Facilities. March 2021, Letitia Manwiller, Student Accounts. April 2021, Louis Rivera, Information Technology. May 2021, Brian Salvador, Marketing and Communications. And June 2021, James Brennick, Information Technology. Congratulations to all Employee of the Month recipients. <laughs> and now, this year's Kutztown University Employee of the Year is Louis Rashuti. The Division of Equity and Compliance is dedicated to offering our students, faculty, and staff a campus where we can learn and work in a welcoming, safe, and inclusive environment, a caring campus community, and where we directly contribute to the well-being and success of our students. It is now my pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague, Mr. Matt Delaney. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. 
Ooh, I'm a little choked up, Lewis. I was as, as surprised as you, so congratulations. Good morning and welcome to another new academic year at Kutztown University. As I begin my second year as Vice President of Finance and Facilities, I want to take a moment to thank our dedicated staff for all their tremendous effort and hard work over the past year. We faced many challenges with the pandemic, and despite a declining workforce and limited resources, we were able to move the institution forward. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the incredible dedication of the facility staff that have worked on the front line over the past 18 months. Your commitment to this university and our campus community was a key component to ensuring a safe and successful residential learning experience for our students. I would ask any facilities team members in attendance to please stand and be recognized. Thank you. The Division of Finance and Facilities, formerly part of the much larger Division of Administration and Finance, continues to evolve as we eliminate and continue to hold vacant several key positions at the top of our organizational structure. These cuts were made as positions became vacant due to retirements, but have not been easy and have required many others to step up and accept more responsibility. I certainly thank my leadership team for their efforts and significant accomplishments over the past year. In the finance area, those accomplishments include balancing the budget without the planned use of cash reserves for the fourth consecutive year. I will speak more on that topic in subsequent slides. The completion of the comprehensive planning process documents, also known as financial sustainability. The primary submission was sent to the state system in September 2020 and was followed by a mid-year update completed in February 2021. Both sets of documents can be found on the university website. The not always smooth and rather challenging transition to the regional procurement office. This initial year included the implementation of SourcePoint, a new procurement software, and the rollout of a new purchasing card system. We continue to have open dialogue with the RPO and hope to strengthen this working relationship in the upcoming year. We have also automated the travel expense process through ESS and have moved away from paper forms. On the facility side, we supported the university with many pandemic-related facility modifications, including the installation of plexiglass in the dining facilities, residence halls, and administrative offices. Coordinated the removal and storage of classroom furniture to meet social distancing guidelines. Modified existing spaces to create both the health center annex and sports medicine annex. We also completed many projects in support of the new strategic plan, including the multicultural center roof and flooring replacement, the relocation of faculty and staff from DFRAN to Old Main, which included the repurposing of excess furniture from DFRAN to many nonprofit organizations. And last, but certainly not least, the administrative office moves which just took place over the past few months. Those moves included the relocation of the LGBTQ plus resource center and women's center to Boxwood House located on Main Street as well as the relocation of the admissions office to the Kemp building, which is adjacent to the Stratton Administration building. 
This new location provides more meeting space and parking for prospective students and their families. For those of you trying to locate human resources, you can find them in the former admissions building, now called the Human Resources Center, at the west entrance of our beautiful campus. As mentioned earlier, I would like to take a few moments to provide a financial update. I promise to keep this brief as we will have plenty of opportunities to discuss the numbers as we move through the fall semester. As a matter of fact, University Senate President Steve Lem has asked me to present a budget update at the sem semester's first meeting on September 2nd. As you can see on the first slide, the university has been able to reverse the downward trend of spending more on expenses than we generate in revenue within the ENG or educational and general operations. The past two years have been our most successful since 2013, even amid a pandemic that has challenged us in so many areas. The success on the ENG side combined with our auxiliary operations, such as housing and dining, have led to an increase in our university-wide cash balances over the past two years. Considering the drop in enrollment and challenges to grow top-line revenues, this has been no small feat. We have eliminated vacant positions, cut operating budgets, and done our best to live within our means. You have all played a significant role in the university's financial success over the past few years. The university and our students have also benefited greatly from the various allocations of COVID-related funding. We have received over $17 million in support that has already or will soon flow directly to our students in the form of emergency grants. This includes over 9.8 million that will be distributed to students over the next nine months. I want to recognize and thank the KU CARES team for all their hard work in allocating these funds to our students with the greatest financial need. We have also received, or are in the process of receiving, over $21.8 million in COVID-related funds to be used directly by the institution. In close consultation with Cabinet and following all the guidelines and regulations, we have used these dollars to replace lost revenue, to cover refunds of student fees, to purchase PPE and prevent the spread of the virus, to offset the cost of faculty distance education payments, and to enhance technology in support of online instruction. A special thanks to Jeff Werner, our Assistant Provost for Research and Grants, for his help in securing funds, interpreting the complex guidelines, and keeping us in compliance. As we begin, As we begin fiscal year 2021-22, we do it with a balanced ENG budget that is based on specific assumptions. Once again, this was not an easy task. A quick review of our revenue assumptions shows no increases to the tuition rate, our share of state appropriation, or overall student enrollment. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about our expenses. Salaries and benefit expenses for our faculty and staff continue to rise each year. We also continue to significantly increase our investment in student aid in the form of merit-based scholarships. This investment is detailed in our strategic plan and is part of a strategy to increase recruitment, improve retention, and reduce student debt. The addition of acrobatics and tumbling should also positively impact our overall enrollment. The lack of additional revenue, coupled with increasing expenses, resulted in a $6 million deficit that needed to be addressed. 
The following strategies were shared across campus during the spring semester and implemented in June as we presented a balanced budget to the Council of Trustees for approval. The reductions included the elimination of vacant faculty positions, retirement savings, elimination of vacant staff positions, an additional 10% of operating budget cuts, and an increase to our projected savings from personnel turnover. A year-to-year -year comparison highlights the specific changes made to the individual budget line items. You may notice an increase to the other revenue line, which was a result of increasing the instructional service fee for our graduate level students. This fee increase in conjunction with the previously mentioned reductions result in a realistic and achievable budget without the planned use of one-time funds. Understanding the challenges that may arise from reducing operating budgets by 10% for the third consecutive year, the President has approved the allocation of one-time strategic funds to each of the Vice Presidents and Deans to be used to help bridge the gap. We hope that individual departments will be able to bring forward requests to their leadership team for funding consideration. Moving forward, and in support of the University Strategic Plan, the Division of Finance and Facilities plans to tackle the following initiatives in support of goal number five, sustainability of resources and stewardship of place. First, financial sustainability and a balanced budget. I have spoken in great detail on this topic already, but I would like to mention that the next version of the comprehensive planning process will be submitted to the state system on September 10th. The DFRAN renovation, as pictured on the slide, will begin in earnest this fall. The renovation is slated to be completed by June 2023 and will provide the university with a stunning new home for our AACSB accredited College of Business. We will also begin the planning process for a renovation in addition to the existing Poplar House, which will result in an admissions welcome center located on Main Street at the east entrance of campus. We also plan to begin the process of developing a new campus facilities master plan, which hasn't been completed since 2013. Finally, we anticipate taking the initial steps toward developing a comprehensive environmental sustainability plan. This will require campus involvement from faculty, students, and staff. I look forward to making steady progress on each of these initiatives during the upcoming year. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our Vice President of University Relations and Athletics, Mr. Matt Santos. Thank you, Matt. The Division of University Relations and Athletics champions the Kutztown University image and brand by showcasing campus excellence and by advancing the institution's mission and vision through cultural athletics, entertainment, and arts programming. I'm going to share some brief highlights from the nine departments that make up the unique structure of our division to give you all a clearer picture of how we are supporting our mission. Our external relations area includes university marketing, web and digital media, communications, government and community relations, and our central switchboard operators. University marketing continues to work hard to increase awareness of KU to prospective students and their parents. We welcomed a new marketing agency, Vision Point, which will partner with us as we continue our promotional efforts. Given that we are in the digital age, the majority of our day-to-day -day advertising occurs online and is directed at our target audience. However, for those of us not in that audience, we will continue to see public branding efforts such as our annual billboard campaign, and ads in local publications. 
Some items to keep an eye out for this year include a new photo book featuring the work of our award-winning photographer, Andy Russell. The book, commissioned by President Hawkinson and produced in tandem with the KU Foundation, features incredible scenes from our beautiful campus. We also want to encourage you to follow the Maine University accounts on Instagram and Facebook, which we use as key marketing tools to promote the university to current and prospective students, and Twitter for university news. Our web and digital media office manages our university website, as well as the award-winning Kutztown University Radio, a proven training ground for many of our students. The website itself includes regular features from our four colleges, as well as news from across campus, and serves as a crucial marketing tool for the university. Average visits to kutztown.edu last academic year was just under 1.1 million. Our communications office and university operators lead the way in proactively providing information to our campus constituents and responding to many customer service inquiries. In addition to the aforementioned digital channels, targeted communications efforts range from the daily brief for faculty and staff, the monthly parent family bulletin, pandemic updates, and regular interaction with the news and sports media. Our government and community relations office continues to advocate for the value of a Kutztown University and state system education by arranging annual advocacy meetings between our student leaders and Commonwealth legislators. The office has also been instrumental in bringing the voting polls back to campus and continues to strengthen town gown relations with the borough and the township. Our unique Pennsylvania German Cultural Heritage Center's mission is to preserve and celebrate the folk life, history, and language of the Pennsylvania German cultural region and a unique educational setting here at KU. We are excited to get back to some in-person programming this year beginning with Heimatfest on September 25th. And more importantly, the staff of the Heritage Center will relocate to the former professional building which is being totally renovated by the KU Foundation and named in honor of East Penn Manufacturing founder, Delight Bridingham. The new headquarters will house the Heritage Center's unique research collection of books, manuscripts, photographs, documents, artifacts, and more in a state-of-the-art research library open to students, faculty, visiting researchers, and the public showcasing four centuries of the Pennsylvania German cultural presence in our region. KU Presents, which coordinates our annual performing artist series, has a full schedule of in-person shows slated for the year ahead and continues to work with the KU Art Society to promote the arts with area youth through play. We hope that you will join us in person for some shows right here in Schaefer Auditorium in the months ahead. Our recreational services and intercollegiate athletic departments are a cornerstone of campus life for our students. Our state-of-the-art rec center has continued to serve as a wellness hub for students, and our club and recreational teams look to get back to action this semester after a one-year hiatus. Despite being without intercollegiate athletics for nearly a year, we achieved some great milestones in our department structure. Renee Hellert was hired last semester and becomes the first woman to lead both men's and women's athletics at KU in our 128 year sports history. <laughs> Renee, you want to, Renee, stand? In support of university enrollment in Title IX, we added our 14th women's sport last fall, the increasingly popular women's acrobatics and tumbling. We will have a team ready to compete in the spring of 2022. We also added the new and unique position of Athletics Diversity and Inclusion Officer and named KU alumnus and Athletic Hall of Famer Bilal Salam to the position. Bilal will work with our athletic staff, student athletes, and the campus community to enhance our DEI efforts. Our teams did return to action in March with spring sports, and although we won't be awarding our annual Coach of the Year award this morning due to limited long year co competition, we were excited to see our head softball coach, Judy Laws, earn her 1,000th career victory in March and lead her team to the PSAC East title and NCAA playoffs, which we hosted here in May. Judy, I think you're back. Judy, stand and take a bow.
Our home athletic events for the 2021 fall season get underway next Saturday at 12.05 when our defending PSAC East champion Golden Bear football team hosts Assumption. Your KUID earns admission for you and up to three guests to enter all regular season athletic contests for free. So we hope you will join us throughout the year and support our outstanding student athletes. Speaking of which, we are always proud of the academic success of our student athletes, and last year was no exception as we had a school record 252 Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference Scholar athletes. That is, a st that is student athletes with a GPA of 3.25 or higher. So congratulations to our student athletes. In closing, I want to thank everyone, all of the members of our division who worked so hard during the past year to keep us going during the pandemic. I want to wish you all a happy and healthy academic year. And on behalf of our division, thank you all for your efforts to make our university great. Please welcome our next speaker, Executive Director of the Kutztown University Foundation, Alex Ojika. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all about another breaking year here at the Kutztown University Foundation. As you will soon hear, we, we had a lot to be thankful for this past fiscal year. We exceeded last year's fundraising record by 17%. We engaged our alumni and friends uh, for nearly 8,000 hours. Our endowment was uh, 43.2 million as of June 30th and we increased scholarships and student aid by 27%. We look forward to continuing our momentum and would like to thank the campus community for their support of what we do on behalf of our students, our faculty, our staff, and our alumni. As we forge ahead with our upcoming comprehensive campaign, I hope that we can continue to count on your assistance and partnership. I am grateful for the many ways you support our efforts to raise funds and increase engagement for the benefit of our great community and our institution. And now it's my pleasure to share with this group the Kutztown University Foundation's Fiscal Year in Review. At the Kutztown University Foundation, we know it's good to be golden. After yet another record-breaking year, we met every challenge head on, fulfilling our mission to raise funds to enhance the quality educational opportunities at Kutztown University and help our students cross the academic finish line. This year, we raised more than $10.3 million, engaged with our Golden Bear community for over 8,000 hours, grew our endowment to $43.2 million, and provided more than $1.6 million in scholarships and financial aid. With your help, we shattered another record with our 1866 Minute Giving Challenge, raising over $167,000 for student groups and organizations. We hosted a week-long virtual homecoming event that brought together Golden Bears from around the globe. We began construction on two world-class facilities, the Wells Rap Center for Mallet Percussion Research, and the Delight E. Breidegum Building, headquarters of the Pennsylvania German Heritage Center. And we provided meaningful ways for our alumni to engage, like free online classes, a book club, virtual gatherings, and drive through events. But while our successes have been great, our students' needs are greater. On October 2nd, the Kutztown University Foundation will announce a 100% student-focused initiative. Its purpose? To ensure our students can earn their degrees and make their mark on the world. Join us in growing a culture of philanthropy, working tirelessly to continue providing scholarships and emergency funds, enhancing student experiences, and creating opportunities for our alumni to engage with KU. Join us. Your presence and leadership can change lives. Because together, we're golden. Thank you. At this time, I would like to ask my incredible team to stand 
and be recognized for their accomplishments this year. Can I stand? I am truly honored to lead this group of individuals, all of whom put in their best effort each and every day to help make KU golden. Thank you so much, guys. Also, for more than two decades on opening day, Kutztown University has recognized outstanding faculty through the presentation of the Arthur and Isabel Wiesenberger Faculty Award for Excellence in Teaching. You will see the names of past award winners on the screen above. And I also we believe we have a couple of our past winners with us. Could, could you also stand, please? <laughs> the Kutztown University Foundation and the Alumni Association are proud to sponsor the Wiesenberger Award. At this time, I'd like to ask our Director of Alumni Relations, Mary Neuenschwander, to join Dr. Hawkinson and I on stage. I would also like to uh, congratulate all the nominees uh, for this year as well. And it's always my great honor to, to announce the 2021 recipient of the Arthur and Isabel Wiesenberger Faculty Award for Excellent in Teaching is Dr. Kurt Freehoff, <laughs> Department of Physical Sciences. Congratulations, Kurt. Also like to uh, bring back to the podium for closing remarks, our president, Dr. Hawkinson. Thank you so much. There's so many wonderful things happening as, as our vice presidents and director of institutional research have just explained. I, I hope you have found the past 90 minutes or so interesting. It truly shows that there a, there's a lot of things for us to be grateful for, and there's a lot of things for us to be hopeful for as we go into this new year. There's a lot of challenges both here and around the world, but there's some wonderful, wonderful things happening right here in our own backyard, and, and, and I hope that this message goes out. All this will be uh, posted on Monday, Matt, and I, I hope that the rest of our university community will see all the good things happening and all the wonderful things we have planned for the future. So congratulations to all those who are honored with awards, tenure, and promotion. Your dedication to our institution truly makes a positive contribution to our community. We had many accomplishments this last year and many challenges. And I look forward to the accomplishments to come as well as the challenges they are inevitable, but working together, we can meet them and come out stronger as an institution. I will continue to meet with numerous units, offices, and constituents through the course of the coming year. My schedule is provided to the Council of Trustees before each meeting and is public record for anyone to review in the trustee meeting book that's available in our library. Anne-Marie and I will continue to host numerous events at our home, the 7th, Faculty art exhibit is being hung right now in the residence with around 25 works on display and faculty continue to submit their books for display in the president's residence li uh, library. Numerous people view the art and books each year and we are delighted to display the talent and scholarship of our faculty. In the coming year, I will continue to host a monthly open office hour so that anyone can come and speak to me in person on any issue. We have in place a number of round table and advisory, gr advisory groups and these groups will continue to meet and provide to me important advice. Of course, I meet with the leaders of the union, senate and other campus leaders to learn of their concerns and suggestions to improve our university community, as well as meetings with area leaders in business and other professions. I continue to serve on the board of directors for Hawk Mountain and Berks Encore. I am chair of the board of directors for the Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference and chair of the board that governs the Chickateague Bay Field Station. 
I meet regularly with the mayor of Kutztown and host town gown meetings at my house for local elected officials, police chiefs, and leading members of the business community. I pledge to continue to work with the faculty, staff, students, alumni, community members, and all other constituencies to do all in my power to continue to move the university forward and to ensure our sustainability and enhance the important role our university plays in our region and society. One thing the pandemic taught us this past year is that we don't know with any certainty what the future will bring. We have learned that there are some things we can control and some things we can't control. But through careful planning, as we talked about today, and our shared experience, we can prepare ourselves for whatever the future brings. Yes, through hard work, perseverance, and grit, and grit, we have positioned our university well for the future. Let us all strive to go forward with a humility and a gratefulness that will unite us as we work to create an enlightened community and a strong educational experience for our students. And so this concludes the faculty and staff convocation and celebration. My best wishes to you all. Have a great year. It's good to be golden. <laughs>